Um, I am the vice president of something or the other, small furry animals and potted plants, I guess, at a company called Ubiquity Networks, which is the largest communications company that you've basically never heard of. We basically provide most of the internet access, long haul internet access, long haul network access, uh, Wi-Fi hotspots, et cetera, et cetera, that you use pretty much anywhere in the world. It's just that you don't know that we're providing the hardware. In, and also in this whole internet of things that's coming up, we provide the internet part of the internet of things. And uh, it's okay that you don't know us. We provide your services and we're happy. And that pretty much works. Um, and that's the quick and dirty blurb about who we are. I'm going to be talking about, well, stuff we'll get into in a moment. I'm also the track host for the DevOps track today. And uh, the general idea is we're going to be wandering through DevOps. And I won't get into the gory details about DevOps, why, who, what, and all that jazz. Uh, you'll see as the day goes along. But uh, what we're going to try and do is take you through a bunch of different aspects in the field, ranging from what I'll start with is kind of a big picture perspective on just fault tolerance and what you as a anything from a developer to an executive to, a, to anybody working at a company, what you should be thinking about from a systemic stability perspective. Um, we'll get into that. There's also going to be a bunch of talks, uh, Jeff and Fred and a uh, bunch of others, uh, going over various aspects of uh, essentially all circling around the same core concept, which is stability, fault tolerance, reliability, and how we can ensure that as you know, people that make stuff happen. Anyhow, so to begin with, the big question here is, as a developer or as somebody involved with the system side of the world, how, how prepared are you? How ready are you or the systems that you're working on or the components or the modules you're working on? How ready are you to make sure that these components, systems, and so on actually you know, work? Because the, the thing is, at the end of the day, about the only thing that's constant, the only thing that's consistent is shit's going to happen. You know, something bad is going to happen, and you just don't know what that is. Look at some really basic metrics. About 60 to 90% of every single software project out there is, is going to fail. It just is. Not just that, somewhere between 10 and 25% of all software projects just get abandoned, as in they just get thrown away. It's like we're not even doing anything with this thing. We don't care. But the funny thing about that is, we're talking about just the software project, which is just code that you're writing or somebody's writing. When you actually think about the project in a bigger context, as part of a, something, a company initiative, a, you know, a, mod, a thing that's being done for finance or a thing that's being done for the product that you're building, whatever, it turns out that the actual numbers that you're looking at are way higher. You know, how much higher can you get? above 60 to 90%. Well, the bottom line, line here is pretty much anything and everything that you work on is probably never going to see the light of day. It's just the truth. That's just the way the world is. Uh, so, you know, why even bother doing stuff? Well, um, yeah, good point. But the thing is, that's waste. And that's waste that can be eliminated across a bunch of different places. The weird thing about this waste is when you actually look at what causes most of this, what causes these crazy numbers, what it actually boils down to is time. It's, the metrics on this are even more amazing. It turns out that timing issues are responsible for something like 75% of everything that gets thrown away. Timing issues are like big picture timing issues. It can be anything from I was late, I got delayed, I didn't get it done on time, to somebody else was late, somebody else was delayed, somebody else didn't get, it, get something done on time, to somebody fell ill, to whatever, you know, stuff, timing issues. The bottom line is, gotta start thinking about fault tolerance. Not fault tolerance, and 
See, here's the wacky stuff. When we talk about fault tolerance, I don't just mean, hey, computer went down, there's a hot spare, and that comes back up. Which, you know, this is an Erlang conference after all. Let's talk about fault tolerance from an Erlang perspective, you know, contextually. Um, it's all there in our, Joe's thesis, section 2.7 or something like that. The six essential components of a fault tolerant system, which is just stuff that he cobbled together from a bunch of different places, but it's relevant. And just to go over them, you got concurrency, you know, stuff's got to work at the same time. You got error encapsulation, fault detection, fault identification, code upgrades, and stable storage. Cool, great. Erlang's got the stuff in it. What's the point? The point is, this isn't about Erlang. This is about everything. It's about fault tolerance. This works across not just the code you're writing, the systems you're building. Heck, it works across your entire company when you get down to it. Let's just look. It's, to be really precise, you got the obvious system stuff. When we talk about company, I don't just mean, hey, the different groups in the dev organization. I'm talking about the different corporate sections. Finance, accounting, sales, support, whatever. Everything's got to be fault tolerant, everywhere. Let's take this one at a time. After all, this is kind of a tech track. Let's go through it from a systems perspective. So what exactly do we, if you want to break out these sections, and we talk about kind of like big picture system design, what's it actually come down to? Start with a couple of these. Concurrency, error encapsulation, and code upgrade. Just for the, you know, half of you who are not aware, by half I mean half of one person who's not aware of the individual components, just to explain this. Concurrency, stuff happens at the same time. Error encapsulation, errors in a particular section somewhere don't go ahead and infect something else. Fault detection, you need to know that bad stuff happened. Basically, that's fault detection. Fault identification, you need to know what it is that happened, not just that something bad happened. Code upgrades, swap out stuff, put new stuff in without having to take everything down. Stable storage, you need to be, you need to be able to rely upon consistent, available storage. That's basically it. If you have systems that ma have all of these pieces in there, you got a magical fault tolerance system. It actually kind of works. I won't go into the details. Google it, plenty of details. Anyhow, these three, these three sections, in the end, when you're designing your system, when you're building your system, there's one fairly simple, magical solution. Just keep this in mind, it works. Just make sure everything that you have in there is loosely coupled. So, what exactly do I mean by loose coupling? Writing a piece of code, you got a bunch of different modules in the code. The modules talk to each other using very strict APIs. They don't depend upon each other. And you want to send something, you throw it over the wall, the other module gets it, and so on. Great, that works with modules. Do the same thing with larger components. Do the same thing with even larger components and modules. Heck, do it across your systems. Do it across your bigger systems. Your accounting system needs to talk to a hosted accounts payable vendor. Break him up. Keep him loosely coupled. The point is why? I mean, there's all the obvious stuff. We know why. We want to do loose coupling, blah, blah, blah. But there's a couple of like, things to remember when we're going down this road. Loose coupling, it breeds trust. OK, now, when I say breeds trust, what you're sitting there, is, what you're thinking is, oh, hey, yeah, these systems are loosely coupled. You can trust them. Uh-uh, that's not the point I'm getting at. The point is, it breeds, it should breed trust in you, sorry. You should trust that bad shit's gonna happen. Really. Trust in the stupidity of people. Trust that things will fail. Trust that you will be affected when things fail. Just assume that that's gonna happen. The more you believe that this is going to happen, the more you'll make sure that you're insulated from the vagaries of stuff that you're not working on. Heck, you know what? You're not perfect. 
there's this entire religion that's made up of the assumption that you're not perfect. You know, so you may as well believe in that stuff too if you want to. But the point being that you're not perfect. If you're working on two things, they're not going to work well together. Something bad's going to happen somewhere. Trust that you are going to screw up yourself. It's a good thing to do. Thing number two. You can devote more brain power to a specific area. Let, let me just kind of like get into a bit of detail about that. Assume you've got 100 units of brain power that you can apply to something, anything, whatever that thing is. If you're working on one thing and one thing alone, just this little tiny area, this is great. You know, it's like me. I'm doing this talk. I'm devoting 100 units of brain power to this talk, which is really depressing when you get down to it. But still, 100 units of brain power. Um, by the way, I didn't talk about big units or small units. In this case, my units are really tiny, but still, 100 units of brain power being devoted here. Supposing I had a whole bunch of plates that I was spinning at the same time. You know, remember those things? Plates and a pole and guys spinning and so on. I got to devote something to make sure the plates don't fall out of those spinning poles. Now I got a problem. I can devote some time to it. Any time I devote to that is time I'm not devoting to you guys which may help those of you guys that are sleeping, but as far as the plates go, now we've got a problem and divided you know, conflicted loyalties and so on. The point being, if your systems are not ridiculously loosely coupled, you're going to be spending more than the absolute minimum amount of time making sure that the stuff works together. That time that you're spending on that is time you're not spending on the component you should be spending time on. Period. Simple. Plain math. There's no way around that. The more you says, keep your system modules separate, the more you keep your components separate, the more time you can focus on actually getting whatever you want to get done, done. It's true. Analysis paralysis. Behavioral psychology has a thing that basically points out that if you're thinking of more than three things at any point in time, your total productivity goes down, like drastically. Three is the max number of things you can do at any point in time. That's it. Done. Uh, you might be an idiot savant or whatever. You might be able to do four or five. Good for you. Party. Most of you aren't. I'm not. The last thing, this is, this is kind of like a bit of an obvious one, but this kind of ties into the previous point too, which is the num there's a bunch of studies that have shown that the number of bugs per line, regardless of what you're doing or what language you're doing and so on, it's basically about the same. By the way, bugs aren't like syntax issues or compiler issues or stuff. It's like actually you know, deep bugs issues that, you've, that you need to fix. The smaller the thing that you're working on, the less bugs you have. I mean, really, that's basically what it comes down to. Simple, stupid, but it's relevant. Keep things loosely coupled. Focus on the small stuff. So this point, somebody, somewhere, the one smart person goes, ooh, performance. What about performance? We need to worry about performance. You got things loosely coupled, you're spending all your energy throwing things back and forth across systems, throwing things, you know, serializing objects, what, whatever, objects, Java. You got to talk to Java at some point, somewhere. You know, it's horrible, but that's life. Um, yeah, sometimes you do. I'm sorry. I mean, it's just bad. We do, which makes my life horrible, but that's a separate issue. Um, so, what exactly do you do about that? Performance is an issue. Well, performance can be a problem. Actually, I won't take it back. Performance is an issue. In fact, it can be a pretty significant issue. But the important thing is, start with point number one. Remember this thing about most software projects fail? Dude, if your project's going to fail, why do you even care what the performance is like? That, uh, this sounds like me being facetious. It's actually, I'm very, I'm being absolutely serious. Just build the damn thing. Odds are it's going to get canceled anyhow. If it doesn't get canceled, you can start worrying about performance. I've never gone wrong doing this. I've been doing this forever. Oh, and some of the stuff that I've built has actually worked and been useful. Some. The ones that weren't canceled. But yeah. Um, so yeah, I know. Every single one of you is sitting here going, ah, but no, no, no. My thing is important. My thing is big. I built this Minecraft detection app that's going to have like, you know, 
It's going to show every single Minecraft user out there, and it's going to have like 10 million users on it within the next month. Yes, absolutely true. Could happen. But it's not. You are a wee insig insignificant little speck of nothing. And, you know, I'm kind of beating you down on this, but the point here being, statistically, the number of systems in which performance really mattered right at the front, and because of performance not being there right at the front, the entire system collapsed, statistically, it is probability zero. That's not you. That's not any of us. It doesn't work that way. It just doesn't. So don't worry about it. That's the bottom line. Just build a damn thing, optimize later, be happy. It'll work itself out. Um, by the way, of course there's a grain of salt with that one. There may be the specific case that actually does apply, but don't worry about it. So next one, fault detection and fault identification. You need to know when something happened, one of the components, and you need to know what it is that happened. Yeah, obvious, right? You monitor it. It's already in your code. You got tracing built into your code. You got monitoring built into your code. It's all good. Life is great. You got dashboards. Life is really, really good. Um, if it's built into the app and the app goes down, what do you do? No, no, no. Our app doesn't go down. We wrote it in Erlang. Right, famous last words, right? <laughs> Stuff goes down. Stuff absolutely goes down. Key point here, do stuff out of band. You know, absolutely do stuff out of band. This actually isn't a joke. I, in, the, in, my, in a past life, I ran a phone company. We built this phone system for small businesses. We had hundreds of thousands of clients scattered around the country. It was great. Life was good. There was pots of money. And our entire monitoring system, the monitoring system of last resort, actually consists of our proprietary phone system uh, being tracked by these things, AT&T cell phones completely out of band, had nothing to do with anything else. So yeah, tin cans and a piece of string actually do tend to, tend to be relevant. The key point being, don't rely on the system to tell you what's going on. It's going to lie. In fact, as Anton pointed out earlier, you will end up in a situation where the only thing the system is doing is passing the tests that you had in the system. Nothing else is going to be working, but the tests will pass. That is guaranteed to happen. Um, last thing, bit of heresy here. If you're talking about serious production, serious production systems which absolutely positively cannot go down and if they need to go down, you need to know what happened and where it went and so on and so forth, be polyglot. If your entire system is written in Erlang, Write your monitoring system in OCaml or something. Seriously, just use something completely different. Have people who had nothing to do with your, with your application development build your monitoring systems. Like a completely separate team working off their, uh, working on the specs. You have specs, right? Okay, get somebody to write specs. And then get them to write the monitoring system based on those specs. Because stuff's going to go down. It just is. And if your, basic, if your thought process behind the monitoring system and the system that you're building is the same, same problem again. You can end up with a system that passes tests. But it's going to be down. Last chunk, stable storage. Yeah, point behind stable storage. Really kind of obvious. You got your system. You put it in there. This is the one that everybody just kind of goes, yeah, I know what I'm doing. It's just kind of, we're going to write to a database. Life is good. Or you really know what you're doing. You're like, yeah, we're adding to a NoSQL database because, hey, NoSQL, you know, first to win, we're happy, or some such thing, whatever. The point being, the po underlying point here being, whatever you're building, whatever you're writing, don't think of this as storage or stable storage or even, let me take a step back. Don't look at this from the perspective of how am I going to store my data? Take a whole bunch of steps back and think about it from the perspective of 
what is it that I'm trying to do? What is it that I'm trying to access? Where am I trying to go with this? To take a whole bunch of steps back, it's all about what we call polyglot persistence, which basically consists of what I call solution-oriented stores. A solution-oriented store basically is an environment in which you are building your system solution first. Every single one of your components, and this could be as small as a module, it could be as large as the ERP system for your company. Every single component, every single loosely coupled component has its take on what it needs for data. Solve its problem. Don't retrofit the problem to the solution. It will not work. Or it'll work for a while and then you'll have two problems. It will. All of a sudden now the care and feed of that store is now a pain in the air. Pain. As a wise guy once said, at the end of the day, all you really want to know is what do you want the data to look like when you pull it out of the database, the data store. And the thing is, you know, th there's an entire track that's going on about NoSQL databases, I guess, which most of them are going to be going over the same thing. There's a bajillion different types of solution-oriented stores. Key value stores, object stores, column, document, graph. They can be eventually consistent. They can be ordered. They can, I mean, it goes on. The bottom line is it's all, at the end of the day, in the service of whatever solution you want. This is the set of tools that you have available as of December. And uh, my extremely unscientific poll of this has shown that there's approximately one new NoSQL database added every 17 minutes. So, <laughs> hey, you got any set of problems. The one thing I would add to this, though, don't write your own. I know you want to write your own. I know you think I can do it. Oh, come on, databases are easy. No, they're not. They're not. Writing databases is not easy. Uh, if you want to write a da database, don't. If you're in the, a company that's building, the, if you're one of the Basha people out here, good for you guys. Everybody else, don't. Um, anyhow, that is the quick and dirty thing there. Back to the big, sis, the big six. When we look at fault tolerant systems, in case I haven't hammered home the point enough, this applies everywhere. Every damn thing that you do, you need to think across all of these, not just one. Your, the systems that you're building, they can be little tiny product-oriented things. They can be big honking systems. They can span divisions. Here's an example. This was from an con earlier conversation with somebody out there. Um, you got a product. It's this nice complex financial product that does nice complex financial trading things and gives you the latest value of some currency option that you want to do who the hell knows what with. You built the system. It's gorgeous. It's great. It's spectacular. You, being the developer, are focusing oh so much time on the minutiae of some obscure edge case that, oh, you know what, somebody filed the bug report on because Whatever. Great. Finance, right? Financial system. Well, you work for a company. The company's got a financial part. There's a CFO. The CFO doesn't care about any of this stuff. What the CFO wants to know is, eh, how much money did we make today? How much did we make yesterday? How much are we going to make tomorrow? The thing is, that finance department, go in and look at what they're using. They're probably using spreadsheets. Um, um, a while back on my blog, I posted this thing. There's an organization called the Euro European Spreadsheet Risk Group or some such thing. They track spreadsheets error, spreadsheet errors that have caused monster problems worldwide. Uh, you've surely heard of the London whale, the JP Morgan guy that lost whatever. There's a bunch of crap that went on there, but a huge chunk of the crap was in one spreadsheet, 
Instead of dividing by the mean of a bunch of values, they divided by the sum of that bunch of values. So as you can imagine, all of a sudden, the number, this was actually their value at risk, that what they thought was at risk, went from being a number x to being a number about an order of magnitude less than x. Oh, hey, we've only lost $60 million, uh, $600 million per day. Now it's real money. The point being, this is the kind of antiquated, archaic, horrific, mind-numbingly dumb stuff that's, resp that's basically responsible for your paycheck. Remember, finance, A-R-A-P. So, yeah, fault tolerance. You, did, you built the best damn financial trading system out there. Some AP clerk in the accounts payable department screwed up a spreadsheet and you're out of business. Remember that. These things apply everywhere. I mean, as a very, very, very smart guy, Helmut von Molke said, it doesn't matter how well you prepare, it doesn't matter what you do. Well, he didn't say bad shit's going to happen, but bad shit is going to happen. And you need to be prepared for that. Which, to kind of take this one level up at this point, this isn't just about systems. In everything that we've talked about, we're talking about systems, we're talking about code, we're talking about whatever. But as I alluded to earlier, you're part of this larger company. You're doing things as part of the organization. The thing is, even within your group, you know, your buddy, the person at the cube next to you, or the office next to you, or the person that you work with, you know, 3,000 miles away, or whatever, uh, people fall ill. Happens. People fall ill. Oh, oh you know what? That's a tester. That's a person responsible for signing off QA. What do we do? Mm, but they're ill. Oh, you know, just get them to go look at it. Oh, uh, no, they can't look at it because uh, they got their eyes poked out by a chopstick. Ah, now we have a problem. You know, stuff happens. You know, it's a, it was a fried rice accident. Things happen. Um, vendors fail. You are oh so happy and then, you know, Amazon proceeds to like violently and royally screw the pooch. And all of a sudden you're Heroku and, you know, you're not very happy on June 29th. That would be an understatement of near biblical proportions, I suspect. But yeah, things happen. Uh, worse, you suddenly get a call from somebody saying, hey, why is the CFO in Brazil? You're like, I don't know. What happened to the money in the bank? I don't know. Happens. Okay, this doesn't happen all that frequently nowadays, but stuff happens. You know, w bad things always happen. And then, of course, there is the worst possible one, which is the things that you don't know. The un as Rumsfeld once said, it's the unknown unknowns. They're the black swans. It's a tail risk. It's the stuff that you didn't expect. It's the stuff that you said is never going to happen that happens. And these these are the ones that kill you. For these, by the way, there really is no preparing. What it basically boils down to is just make sure you're agile enough so that you can recover and kind of like survive when these things come along. Um, true story, financial crisis, we had to downsize by, let's just say a very large number and I had to personally let go of a very large percentage of my company. It was not pleasant, it wasn't pretty, but you had to do that. That was bad. That was really, really bad. But we survived, and as a company, we came back and eventually hired back a bunch of the people and so on and so forth. So, you know, it happens. But we were in a position where we could do things like that. Just need to be careful. So, remember the big six? Let's just run through the same thing again, but this time think you as part of a company, not you building a piece of code fault-tolerant organization. So the obvious thing, concurrency. And by the way, when, I say, when I'm saying organization, you don't necessarily have to think, you know, me in development and me in product and me and somebody else in finance and somebody else in customer support. Just think about different groups in your same 
or different people in your group or different groups in your same development team and so on and so forth. Can you guys work at this, on multiple things at the same time? Yeah? No? Are you sure? Uh, do you have the hairball micromanaging <laughs> boss? Happens. You can't do anything without the boss taking a look at it. You'd be surprised at how, hor how frequently stuff like this happens. If you work for any company which has more than, oh, approximately 100 people in it, you got some variant of this somewhere in the company, I guarantee you this. If you don't, you're really lucky. But um, anyhow, separate story. It exists. Um, error encapsulation. Bit of a trickier one, but um, remember the QA guy who got his eye po poked out with a flying chopstick while eating fried rice? Cool, excellent. What do you do? Is that error encapsulated? It's an error. Can you figure out some way around the thing? Don't let problems with one group, QA is running behind, or development's running behind, or the development of the interface to the bus is running behind. Can we continue with everything else? Yeah, lose coupling, all of that fun stuff, but as a team, can you guys progress? By the way, the single largest enemy to being able to do error encapsulation is something that I call the executive fire truck. Let me explain the executive fire truck. Say you're the lead developer. The lead, forget developer, it's your baby. You own whatever's going on. There's a problem. Some problem, somewhere. What's your, what's the likelihood that you go, back off everybody, I'll take care of it. I got it, I fixed it. Happens, right? We do this, I've done this, everybody does this. That's a bad thing. That's the executive fire truck. That's the executive pulling out the fire truck going, everybody back away, I'm gonna put off the fire, put out the fire. It's like, yeah, great, cool, wonderful, but you know what, how many of you are there? One. How many fires can you fight at one time? One. What are you doing while you're fighting the fire? You're not doing anything else. What should you be doing? Everything else, not fighting the fire. It's an important point. Don't pull out the executive fire truck. Just don't. Put it away, throw away the key. Fault detection. Fault detection, you need to know when bad stuff happens. Um, to take a little lesson from the Erlang world, there are two sides to this. Think of the difference between link and monitor. You need to know when something bad happens. This is people in that organization, that group, that team, need to be smart and well-adjusted enough and self-confident enough to tell you that something bad is happening. Even better, to tell you before something bad happens. Yo, Mahesh, we're not gonna be able to make the deliver deliverable that O was due at 11.15. Uh, That's bad. Hey, Mahesh, we're not gonna be able to make the deliverable due next week. That's a much better one. That's the link side of things. Monitor, yeah, you know what? You need to kind of pay attention to what other people are doing. You need to do that. Um, and of course, no executive fire trucks. Just remember that. Fault identification. This is kind of like a subset of the reporting bit. When you guys are talking to each other, when the teams are talking to each other, don't just say, hey, Bob's ill. He's got his eye poked out with the chopstick. Um, sorry. Tell him what that means. Bob's ill, we can't finish the QA thingy, we can't deploy, can't meet the 5 p.m. deadline, which means we're not gonna be able to make the release of the product next week. Oh, now the CFO's interested. Because that's what the CFO cares about. The CFO, except for a passing interest, doesn't care about Bob and the chopstick at all. Fire truck. Um, so, Code upgrades. What's a code upgrade when I talk about organizations? What's a single most common code upgrade-like thing that happens in a company? You hire someone. How's the onboarding at your company? Fred just joined Heroku. What's the onboarding like? Don't answer that. But the point being, what's, the on what's it like? Most places I've ever worked, it's this. Seriously. Oh, these are my companies, by the way. And I'm actually really good at this stuff. Uh, 
trust me on that. Um, not for that guy though, but usually I'm really good at this. But the point being, typically the way we tend to do this thing, because we're all alpha males, tragically all alpha males here, which is really sad, but still. We're all alpha here. So what we end up doing is we're like, yeah, there's the water. <laughs> Enjoy. That's a problem. You got to have good processes in place to bring people on board. Show them what's going on. They'll be way more productive. Oh, and the last one, this is the horrible one, stable storage. Um, the thing about stable storage, what's stable storage for an organization? Standard rules, systems, practices standard mechanisms by which you can do things so that when somebody leaves and somebody else comes in, they know what's going on. I don't mean this. What I do mean, however, is if the CFO leaves and you get a new CFO, uh, that person can come on board quickly. If you're the person who's absolutely in charge of all the interfaces into RabbitMQ, decides that uh, he or she is much better off working for Klarna and you know, hides themselves off to Sweden, hey, the next person you bring in plugs right in rapidly. How do they do that? Not just onboarding. Onboarding with what? The specs I mentioned earlier, the ones that you know, nobody ever writes. Writing is painful. Writing sucks. Writing is a good thing to do. Write. I can't emphasize that enough. Anyhow, to bring this whole thing to a conclusion, at the end of the day, when you're writing code, when you're not writing code, you're just interacting with people, when you're building out your team, when you're expanding your team, when you're building out systems, when you're doing anything involving your professional life, maybe even your personal life, but that's a step. we're not talking about that here. When you're doing anything, ask yourself just one simple question. Now, is it safe? Is it gonna work? Just look at it from the perspective of what's going to break. I can guarantee you, if you look at it from that perspective, you're going to find stuff that's going to break. If the question is, or if the statement is, yeah, that's probably not going to happen, oh, yeah, it's going to happen. I guarantee you that. So just remember that part. And with that, um, I'm done. So, any questions? By the way, the flying chopstick incident actually happened. I'm not making this up. Uh, eye patch. It wasn't me, but it actually was. It was uh, a separate story. I'll tell you over beer at some point. But it was not good. Funny, but not good. Right. So, okay, so you can get crazy paranoid about this stuff. Yes, absolutely true. You can just go down the rabbit hole of every single possible thing that can go bad. But the point here isn't analysis paralysis. The point isn't, therefore, don't do anything. The point is set yourself up so that when the stuff happens, you are in a position where you can recover. That's the important thing. It's about agility. It's, by the way, agility, not be agile development and scrums or whatever. It's about being in a position where you can react rapidly and survive something happening. The loose coupling thing I mentioned, the point is when something bad happens to all the other teams, and think about it this way. I mean, again, basic math. Let's say there's a 10% probability that any particular team is going to screw the pooch. Great. You've got 10 teams. The odds of it being some other team, very high. The odds of it being you, 10%. So the key here is don't depend on them. And that's the point I'm getting at. Make sure that you are largely decoupled. And that, at the end of the day, that's about 
mocking and test suites and making sure you've got simulators and making sure you've got mechanisms by which you can test load, which are reasonably accurate and simulate the load that you are gonna hit, but don't depend upon actually you know, racking up computers and saying, okay, turn yourself on and let's see what happens. I know these are stupid things, but I've seen this happen. So, um, true story. A colleague of mine, a long time ago, was given a very simple task. Um, just a nylon hawser, a big nylon rope, that to test the breaking strain on the rope. So how did he do that? Now if it was me, because I know nothing about ropes, what I'd do is I'd Google test breaking strain of rope, and I'd go, okay, fine, you know, there, here's a company that tests the breaking strain of ropes, and you ship it to them, and they send it back, and they say, you know, 17,000 pounds per whatever the hell it is, the appropriate metric is. Um, my buddy was an engineer. So am I, but he was like, this is what he did for a living, kind of, as in mechanical shit. So what he did was he, yeah, worse, he actually went to Nebraska and he built this thing, this, by the way, is absolutely true, built this whole thing in which he attached two weights to the end of it, hooked the rope up to a motor, started spinning the thing faster and faster until it snapped. And he knew what the RPM was. And oh, by the way, there's a whole cage on top of the thing because when it snaps, what happens to the weights? They go flying off. You don't want to be there when the weights go flying off. So he stood on top of the thing while it rotated and then it snapped. I got a picture somewhere of this whole crazy Rube Goldberg contraption. And when I said, why didn't you Google this? He's like, oh, I never thought of it. That's the point, you know, it's, just assume people are gonna do really stupid things. Just disconnect yourself from that. Um, anything else? If not, thank you all again, appreciate it. Next we have Jeff.